Next up, uh, we have the leader of one of the more consequential platforms in the world. Uh, Susan Wojcicki is the CEO of YouTube, um, a Google property she's run for many years now. Uh, prior to that, was a key executive in the growth of Google over the past decade. So welcome to Signal again, Susan. It's good to see you. See you too. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Um, it's been uh, quite a tumultuous four months, and we've been talking about that in, you know, over the past 24 hours here at the uh, conference. But it's also been a tumultuous 24 hours um, in the digital world with a hack at Twitter uh, and a, a news coming out of Europe and all sorts of things. But I want to focus first um, on one of the themes that we've been talking about uh, throughout the past day, uh, which is the you know, disruption that has been accelerated in the world of media. Uh, and YouTube is really one of the key uh, actors in that. Um, you stood up uh, YouTube TV uh, a number of years ago, uh, and that's been growing quite nicely. Um, and this phenomenon of cord cutting um, it has been you know, growing, but I think you know, it may have reached its peak in the past four months. What behaviors have you seen uh, across the YouTube platform in these past four months that we might gain some insight from? We've definitely seen a lot of changes on our platform, just as all of our lives were upended and, and all of us have been uh, impacted in many different ways. Um, people working from home, not having access to the same resources that they used to have beforehand um, or services being shut down. And so we certainly have seen a significant increase in people who are using our platform. And that has extended to many different areas. Um, first of all, we thought that we had a real responsibility to make sure that we could get the word out around the right ways to address COVID-19. Um, so we immediately worked with everyone being at home, right, Fitch settling in, trying to figure out how do we how do we run this company with everybody globally being at home. Um, we reached out to all the different public health officials. We work with over 80 different public health officials around the world, um, and we've served hundreds of billions of uh, impressions related to COVID-19 information, health information um, coming from health authorities. So that was one of the ways that we've responded. Um, but we've certainly seen um, that our users are looking for different types of information. So, for example, we've seen a doubling in the number of people looking for homeschooling, um, looking for meditation information, um, looking for how to, like how to, how, things they never looked for before, right? How do you cut your dog's hair? How do you cut your own hair? Um, so we've seen a big increases uh, from that perspective. And uh, we've also seen a lot of people using YouTube in a new way they never used it before, um, whether that is um, groups that are um, small, for example, small churches, the Vatican, um, community outreach, schools, um, all using YouTube as a way of staying in touch and connecting that otherwise they wouldn't have. Uh, beforehand. So, um, and then we've seen the risk of misinformation, which has always been a, a, you know, something we've taken very seriously. Um, so we've had to be super active in that area. Uh, we have removed 10, we've made 10 different policy changes and we've removed over 100,000 videos that had some kind of misinformation related to COVID. So those are just a few examples of the ways that we have seen really dramatic change on the platform. And, and, you know, that issue that you raised about misinformation and your, you know, quick response to it as it relates to COVID-19, did that, did that inform, did you learn in the sort of acceleration and the need to respond that quickly? Did you learn new best practices or insights in, you know, what has become an age old, you know, issue uh, of whack-a-mole where, you know, against misinformation on all sorts of different topics, not just, of course, health, but, you know, across, uh, you know, everything from elections to, you know, state actors. Have you learned uh, new approaches that might inform how you go forward? We've really invested in what we call responsibility over the last four years. And because of all the investments that we've made, whether it's people, processes, 
um, technology. And again, we have literally thousands of people and large engineering teams who are focused on this now. We have really excellent policymakers who can jump into action. And it's because of all the work that we made over the last four years that we were able to really, really quickly spring into action. Um, and we saw people just, for example, making up um, conspiracies like uh, coronavirus um, comes from 5G. That would be like an example. And we said, no, if you uh, if you uh, say that the symptoms come from something other than a virus, that's a violation of our policies. Um, but on the other hand, I do want to just point out, um, you know, we really have to be sensitive when we make these policies that we don't infringe on free speech or the ability for people or academic discussion. Um, for example, at one point, I did the CNN interview, um, and I just said, um, you know, we use World Health Organization as a guideline for our uh, d decisions, on, like if something violates what World Health Organization says. And I had all these different academics and people who wrote to me um, and said, hey, like World Organization doesn't always get it right. And of course, we actually also look at local health authorities, but it just gives you an idea of how complex this issue is. Like you want to enable there to be debate and you want to enable academics to be able to, um, and experts to be able to have a free discussion about what are the right ways to address this, but you also want to make sure that users are getting the right information. So it's a very fine line. It absolutely is. And, and that same issue of the ability to have an open conversation about, you know, difficult and nuanced topics. Uh, relates directly to the issue of hate speech, which has animated a recent social media boycott um, and certainly has animated, you know, the social movement that has risen in the United States and around the world. Um, I'm curious how that plays into your perception and your work on brand safety. There's not a brand that I'm aware of that wants to be near hate speech uh, when it comes to their advertising. Um, and that's something that I know you've worked on and you worked on with P&G specifically several years ago. Um, how has all of this impacted that work? We, we, uh, so we've worked incredibly hard to make sure that we have the right policies in place for hate speech. And uh, first of all, hate speech has always been a violation of our policies. But what we did was we really tightened the definition of it uh, uh, last year. And we also significantly increased our enforcement of it um, and added new categories. And, and for example, we also internationalized it to make sure that we were able to address all parts of hate speech. Um, like there are different ways that people could be discriminated in India, like caste, for example. Um, we added veteran status um, that can't discriminate um, or uh, against anyone who's a victim of a violent event. Um, and of course, race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, et cetera, immigration status, all of these different areas. Um, and, and in any way, use that to, uh, to discriminate, promote violence. Um, and so we implemented this, we really, really tightened it last year. Um, that saw a 5x increase in the number of videos that we have removed. Um, mm. And we continue to tighten it. We actually are always looking at it and saying, look, these are the changes that we've made. Um, this is what's resulting on the platform. Now we need to make a few additional changes. And so we're continually looking at it. And, and I would actually argue that, that uh, it's not, it's not whack-a-mole because you, when you have good processes and people and technology in place, you really can make a, a huge difference. And we measure this, we measure it very scientifically and precisely, and we know exactly uh, you know, what there's a small amount um, that may get through. And then when we find it, we remove it. So we're very, uh, we approach this in a very scientific way. To take it very no, seriously. There's definitely a sense, and, and I think this has been heightened by recent reporting in the New York Times and, and elsewhere, that platforms like YouTube have a, a significant impact on how people think, on, on what they believe, uh, mm -hmm. uh, on what have been called confirmation bias or filter bubbles. Um, have you taken steps to counter that besides just removing speech? Are you trying to steer sure. people to 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 information that 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 might counter counter act or counterbalance uh, some of sure. the impact of, of these uh, perhaps more out there theories? Yes. No, that's a great lead in. Uh, thank you, Johnson, because we actually talk about four, what we call the four R's of responsibility. And so the first one is remove. And that's what I spoke about. And there are three more. 
Um, so the next one is um, raising up. So whenever we're dealing, for example, with medical information, we only want to raise up and show authoritative information, whether it's from the CDC or the Mayo Clinic um, or any other kind of expert association. Um, we also, what we what we do is if there's content that's borderline, we reduce it. That would be the other, the third R. Um, so let's say there's a video saying, you know, aliens land, landed in my backyard and they told me this about COVID. Um, that would be something we would consider low quality content and uh, and we would we would not recommend it to our users. And so that would be reduce. The fourth um, is reward. And that's actually comes into the brand safety area that we've been working on for a number of years. And we take incredibly safe, um, incredibly important to us. Um, and that's making sure that we have an even higher standard when it comes to the content that we monetize to make sure that A, we're keeping our advertisers safe, but also it's a way of managing the uh, and making sure that the reward is going to content that's valuable to the platform. Now, I know that uh, on many of the minds of folks in the United States, certainly, is the impact that such a powerful platform might have on the election. You've taken some steps uh, in the past uh, year or two. Can you tell us what you're doing to ensure that folks are well informed uh, through YouTube as it relates to election, uh, the election coming up? Um, well, election integrity is also an incredibly important part of our responsibility work. And, um, you know, first of all, we, we do work to make sure that we do have candidates and uh, all kinds of elected officials on our platform to be able to communicate with their constituents. But we want to make sure with regards to any kind of election work that we're doing everything we can. Uh, so we certainly work, we've implemented a really tight policy for anyone who's an advertiser. They need to follow the guidelines. They, those, all of those ads that are placed for any kind of election ad um, are placed in a library. It's visible for anyone to see what the pricing, uh, what the creative was, what was the targeting, how big was the campaign, what was the way um, it was it was set up. Um, we also have a threat analysis group to be able to look and see is there any kind of coordinated activity that's happening across the platform um, and make sure that we're proactive in removing that. So, um, And then lastly, we have an intelligence group because we know that the current threats are not going to be the same next time as they will be this time. So we actually work really hard to try to understand, is there something happening on the platform that we don't know about? Um, and so these are all different ways that we um, that we work. I do want to point out one thing that's really, uh, I think, very important, which is that we hold elected officials to the same standards as all other individuals. So if you have an elected official and they say something hateful, um, they promote violence in some way, then we would take the same steps that we would with any individual. So there's no free pass for anyone who's an elected official. And we think that that's really important uh, to make sure that we treat, have one standard for everyone. I mean, it, what what you're what you're not saying that I will say is that's not what Facebook does, um, and because <laughs> uh, you're being politic and that's appropriate, but um, my job is to just to make sure our audience knows you know the backstory here, which is that is a different policy from from that of a, another very large and influential platform, Facebook. Uh, and to that end, I'm curious if you have a point of view or a statement you might make about the you know burgeoning and current uh social media boycott that has been driven uh by many groups who believe that uh platforms can be uh you know encouraging of hate speech so so definitely you know this um you know, we want to work very closely with all of the different advertising groups whether it's the ANA um, or the different civil societies, or the Global Alliance for Responsible Media, um, and they have put out a number of different points um, that that they expect of their advertisers. And I think those points make a lot of sense. Um, we're working to really, um, you know, first of all, I think we already meet a lot of those requirements, um, and we're and, and it's very important to me that we are a responsible platform. And so whenever we get feedback from an advertising um, an advertiser, advertising group, or civil society about how we could be better, I want to take that seriously, and I want to make sure that we're considering that or having a discussion with them about what are the implications, because there always can be these side implications of changes that we make, and have them also understand that. So um, I understand why, um, you know, uh, why the advertisers have taken the position that they have, and um, again, we're very supportive of making sure that we're a responsible platform, and that's one of the 
that's one of the legacies I want to make sure that I leave uh, and that mm -hmm. I'm really focused on is that YouTube was focused on doing the right thing. And looking back, and when we look back in history, you know, this is a unique time. This is a hard, uh, a lot of hard decisions are being made in terms of um, new media and how what's the right balance between responsibility and free speech. And um, it's there's no established path. Um, we are needing to consult with experts and find the best solutions. And I want to make sure that when we look back on this time, that that we feel that YouTube took a really uh, reasonable and uh, and responsible path. Yeah, let me ask you now uh, on behalf of both uh, our host PNG and all marketers. Um, there are a number of trends that might be unnerving to folks who are used to buying thirty second spots on television. Um, you know, but between the cord cutting and the subscription television, I have YouTube TV, um, you know, uh, and we pay for it every month. Uh, you know, is is television advertising as we know it a, uh, a dinosaur? Is it going to be gone? Um, and, and what do you think replaces it? Well, we see, first of all, YouTube has, I mean, I think they both have a place um, right now, but we've certainly seen tremendous growth with YouTube. And we are actually strongest in the categories where probably TV sees the most amount of cord cutting. Um, and so uh, we certainly are, see that we have tremendous reach. Um, so if you look at 18 to 49 year olds, um, and, and this is a Nielsen stat, we actually have more reach and more 18 to 49 year olds than all of linear TV combined um, that come and see YouTube in a month. Um, and so that really affords an opportunity for a lot more reach at, at an efficient price. Um, and we actually see with the campaigns that have been run um, that a lot of times marketers can have uh, about a 66% increase, like almost two thirds of reach that they wouldn't be able to have on TV. And so um, I think, John, as you know, I used to run the ads um, business at Google. I worked on that for 10 years in terms of building all of our products. And one of the lessons is, is that, um, that, that you know, what I would look at first is where are the users going? What are the users engaging in? And, um, and then wherever you see usage, then it makes sense for advertisers to go to be able to get the scale afterwards. And so uh, I do think that... Um, I think that uh, well, both of them have a place, and TV advertise TV networks advertise on YouTube too. Um, mm -hmm. So we definitely have a good partnership and relationship. Um, but but digital also offers all these new different types of formats, new forms of measurement, um, new ways of engaging. Um, advertisers can also have a presence on YouTube. They can engage with their users um, organically. They can measure. We offer many different formats, whether they're brand, direct response, um, um, different of charging. I think there's definitely a lot of opportunities for marketers on digital uh, that that just enable them to enhance the campaigns and their work that they're doing. And yeah. you know, YouTube is also really, I'll point out, it's one of the only platforms that's really focused on video. Um, there's certainly many other platforms, but they may offer a, a, a broader, you know, a different set of, of creatives and focus. And we're really a video first platform. So for marketers who want to get a story across, um, who have beautiful creatives, want to run them, want the users to see them and engage with their stories. Um, and uh, YouTube really is a good platform, an excellent platform for doing that. How how important is the YouTube TV, I'm going to use a bad word here, bundle uh, to the future of your business? I, I ask because it strikes me that you know, when when I first cut the cord myself, um, I was so excited I got to pick whatever I wanted to watch. Um, you know, I paid for a la carte, whatever, you know, made sense, a little HBO here, maybe some Showtime there. And from YouTube, I got a, an incredibly good deal for some of, some of the core stuff that I still wanted from the old cable world. But that price has more than doubled in the last few months, a uh, few years. Pardon me. And I know that that's not because, you know, you're there, Susan, trying to just extract as much profit as you can. I know that's because your vendors are charging you more for what you then put into the YouTube TV bundle. You know, but are we just recreating cable all over again in the streaming world? Or is there something truly new that we can look forward to here? Well, I mean, first of all, YouTube TV uh, is... I think is a really innovative product because it takes all the features that we have with technology and the internet and apply it to TV. And that was one of the reasons we created the product. 
um, the ability to see content on demand, to be able to search it, to have recommendations, to have it be cross device. Um, all of those are incredibly important. And, um, and, and, you know, I think if you look at the current price of YouTube TV, it's still really, really affordable compared to, um, uh, cord, um, or, or more traditional bundles. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, and you get a lot more features. It's also, we supports up to six accounts, um, right. and all of those can be personalized. So we still think this is a really, for anyone who is interested in watching sports or news or wants to have the, the, um, the latest, the real time live shows, we think this is a really important, um, product for them. So we'll continue to invest here and you're right. It had to do with the content being raised. So we, our costs were raised and, and unfortunately we had to pass that on, but, um, you know, we're hopeful that, you know, it was not, we don't want to be doing price increases every month. So we're really, you know, we tried to do a price increase that will, that will last us for a while. Yeah. Well, good. I hope so. Um, one, one last I question. Hope so too. <laughs> this pulls back <laughs> a, a little bit, but there has been a broad critique of the technology industry over the past four or five years that I think might be boiled down to unforeseen externalities. Um, the, the technology industry has always charged ahead, you know, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Um, but the externalities of at scale technology have certainly become very evident uh, in any number of ways over the past several years. Um, are you integrating a, an approach to both the design and the looking ahead and looking forward and around corners to imagining potential future externalities of the things that at scale platforms like Google and YouTube uh, might, might create? Uh, and is that part of your design thinking that's, that, that, that's a new approach or has that been how you've been thinking for some period of time? I'll try to think when we release new features or we build new products, what those certainly what the benefits can be, right? And uh, I think there are there are many benefits. Um, and we also listen to our users, so that's a really important part of our product development process. Uh, on the other hand, I will say when you release a new product, there'll be a lot of new benefits that you might might not have thought about, um, and there'll be some use cases that you that you uh, might not have thought of either that you want right. to in some way prevent. And um, I mean, I think this is true for all technology and we work really hard to understand what the implications of them are and, and do so responsibly. But yeah. we, we uh, um, you know, innovation is, I think, really core to what we do. Um, and it's it's been a... Um, it's definitely been a hallmark of Silicon Valley. And um, I think we also find that that innovation happens, right? If you if you don't innovate, somebody else will. Um, yeah. And so you need to, you know, our, a lot of times when we think about these markets, we think about like, what's the best way if, you know, if we are in it, if YouTube's in it or if Google's in it, what's the way that we can help lead the market in a responsible way? Um, sometimes if it's done by another party, they may not have, like Google has a really important, has a brand name and our trust with our users is incredibly important. And that at some day level is the most important asset that we have. And so we want to make sure that when we release products that we maintain that for our users. Yeah. But um, it, like, we'll continue to always think about what are the unintended uses and how can we how can we manage that responsibly? But look, like we didn't anticipate there was going to be a pandemic. Um, like, you know, <laughs> some people did, None of us um, did. but, None but of us did I think too. technology has, has all these new use cases, right. During, right. Uh, it, you know, kids, look, I think, you know, I really, uh, you know, kids really benefit from being in school, but if they can't be in school, at least they can have online classes. Right. Um, right. We can communicate, we can, people can run their companies online using, digital technology. And so we've certainly seen during this time um, that there have been a lot of benefits that we didn't anticipate that technology would provide during a period where we everyone needs to social distance. Unquestionably. And Susan, thank you so much for coming to Signal again and, and sharing your insights and wisdom with us. And for the work that you're doing, I know that it isn't easy. Um, so it's much appreciated. And you're obviously a really important partner to P&G. So thank you very much for thank coming you. again to Signal. I want to say P&G has been an incredibly important partner to us. And um, I want to thank Mark and, and everyone at P&G for working 
with us. Uh, p and is incredibly, such an important partner. And we know that things haven't always been smooth and we appreciate uh, that p and working with us and it's made us a stronger partner and we want to do everything we can to continue that partnership and continue to grow together. And so I just want to say thank you. Absolutely. Well, thank you. 